So we begin the course with writing a summary. This is the first assignment you have, and rather than waiting even a moment to tell you how to do it, I want to dive right in and give you that information. Um, this lecture is inspired by my first year of teaching. When I assigned a summary, but didn't teach my students how to do it, and then I got a bunch of feedback at the end of the semester that said, he never told us how to do this. He, he asked us to do it, but he never told us how to do it. I had no idea that my students didn't know how to write a summary. I had had to write a precy in high school. A precy is a sort of standalone summary, which is the, the assignment that we're talking about today, which is distinct from the sort of summary that Graf and Birkenstein are talking about in our textbook, They Say, I Say. That's when you use use summary inside a larger argument. But I just assumed that my students knew, and their feedback inspired uh, the lecture that you're seeing today. Um, now, we want to make a distinction between, again, the precy, the standalone summary, this first assignment, and what Graf and Birkenstein are talking about, and they say, I say, but please understand that what Graf and Birkenstein are talking about in chapter two of They Say, I Say, when they talk about how to include summary in a larger piece of writing, that's our long goal here in this course. Um, so you're, you know, down the road, you need to write a research paper. Where do you start? This entire semester is going to be writing a research paper in slow motion. And we begin, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here to chapter one of They Say, I Say, um, which you didn't have to read today. I guess in some ways it's just skipping back because I assigned chapter two. So we jump back to chapter one to find out, you know, what's the core idea of They Say, I Say, where Graf and Birkenstein say the following, to give writing the most important thing of all, namely a point, a writer needs to indicate clearly not only what his or her thesis is, but also what larger conversation the thesis is responding to. But how do we express that larger conversation if we don't know how to take a large conversation and condense it? I mean, lots of people know how to quote. Quoting's easy. Copy, paste. Control C, control V, question marks or, or quotation marks around it, we're done right? But what if we need to get more information across to our reader? Well, that's when summary comes to the fore. And with just about every research paper that you will have to write in university, there will be occasions when summary will be the better choice, the absolute better choice to demonstrate that you have entered this larger conversation and that you understand it. Because simply quoting someone else shows that you can find an article and that you can potentially identify relevant information, but it doesn't necessarily demonstrate that you have mastery of that content. Whereas summary always will. Because when we summarize, we put someone else's concepts into our own words, we condense their concepts, potentially not simplifying them, but making them more readily accessible and demonstrating that we have not only entered the conversation, um, but what we understand it. And, and that will strengthen, this is the other thing, it strengthens our response. Because a lot of the time when students have to respond to academic writing, academic articles, academic books, academic ideas, they struggle to write research papers about it, not because they're not very smart, but because they haven't taken the time to really absorb that information. And the whole first section of They Say, I Say is about what they say. That's where we're starting in this course. Let's begin with what they say. Almost all writers struggle with writer's block, and students especially do, especially when they're under stress. How do we avoid running ourselves into the wall of writer's block? We begin with what they say. And we'll talk about this more in an upcoming lecture, but for now, just simply trust me that beginning with what others say is the best approach that we can take to research writing. But we want to get on to how to write a summary right now, rather than hanging on, uh, you know, my telling you that it's going to be really useful later on, because what you need to do right now is write just a summary. In chapter two of They Say, I Say, which is about 
including summary in a research paper, Graf and Birkenstein say the following, if it is true, as we claim in this book, that to argue persuasively, you need to be in dialogue with others, so again, starting with what they say, then summarizing others' arguments is central to your arsenal of basic moves. Central to your arsenal of basic moves. What Graf and Birkenstein are saying is, this is important stuff. Summary should not be skipped. Um, I think it's one of the most important things that we can do as a writer is to learn the art of summary and then to include it in our writing. Graf and Birkenstein also say that when assigned to write a response to an article, writers might offer their own views on the article's topic while hardly mentioning what the article itself argues or says. What Graf and Birkenstein are saying here is that we can sometimes respond to a writing prompt for an assignment without necessarily ever mentioning what others have to say. You might say, well, that's not a problem. That's a good thing, isn't it? If I respond to the prompt and I write it all out of my head, aren't I demonstrating how smart I am? Potentially, but most of the papers that you're going to write in university require you to use articles. They require you to use what we call secondary sources. Secondary scholarly sources. You'll hear scholarly sources, articles, journals, books. You'll hear all sorts of things from your profs. They'll have requirements for you, but almost always those requirements are about listening to what others have said on the subject that you're writing about and then responding to what they've said. It's not about you simply stating what you think about whatever it is, which is very distinct from the way in which we argue or um, converse or debate, say, on the internet, through social media, in, you know, the, the old don't read the comments thing, right? In comment threads, at the end of articles, it's readily apparent, it's frequently readily apparent that people don't read the article. They read the, they read the title, they read the first paragraph, and they respond, but they haven't read the whole thing. So they don't have a strong sense of what's said there. But they, by God, they have an opinion. And we're really good at giving our opinion. We're really good at arguing. Most of my students can argue about things really, really well. But what they fail to do well is to demonstrate how their argument is situated in the larger conversation that it's related to. So within the context of our course, we're taking a look at Hiroshima and Godzilla. And my students get to choose one of those two uh, rivers, threads, to follow for these assignments. Now, what does someone know about Godzilla? Well, they might know something about the recent um, American films. They might know, you know, something from those movies, but they wouldn't necessarily know a lot of the stuff about the earlier Japanese films. And... And so, you know, if we're going to enter a conversation about Godzilla, then we ought to know something about the history of it, right? Not to simply just state what we think about it. Well, I saw the last movie and I didn't like it very much, you know, isn't really entering the conversation fully in the way that university uh, writing requires of us. So how do we summarize? You know, and of course, there's the wonderful moment in uh, Princess Bride when Inigo Montoya says, let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up, right? Uh, we, we just need a summary. And when we need a summary, we don't need a ton of details. I don't know if any of you know these sorts of people, but they're the, they're, they're the, the people who tell stories that include the date, and they, they sit there for a while, and they go, wait a second, what year was that? Um, and then they include where they were, and who all was there, and what their relationship to those people were, when maybe the point of the story is, you know, don't drive on an icy highway uh, in, you know, without uh, winter tires. You know, that's all they would need to say. Um, summarizing, being able to state what is needed with the greatest amount of concision. So how do we do this? And this is all based on a wonderful uh, book that is sadly out of print now, um, A Brief Guide to Writing from Readings by Stephen W. Will Hoyt. Uh, I came across this the year after my students were like, hey, you didn't teach us how to do this. So I said, well, I obviously need to teach them how to do it. And I entered the conversation as it were. I went and I found a source and I read what it said and now I'm relaying it back to you. Um, 
So how do we summarize? We begin by reading. And some of you might be like, what? This is, this is, this is, this is your advice. This is what I paid my tuition for. Trust me. While, you know, on this assignment, you might be like, well, of course I'm going to read it. I have to summarize it. Why wouldn't I read it? But I get a lot of research papers from students where I can tell they didn't read the article that they were referencing. Instead, they simply strip mined it for great quotations. They found really cool, relevant quotations, sometimes even irrelevant quotations that just sounded profound. And they copied them and they pasted them, but they didn't really read the article. They don't really fully understand it. So we don't want to just read it once either. We want to read, reread, and annotate the source text. You might be like, I have five courses, man. I don't have time to be reading this article on Godzilla once, let alone twice. Are you crazy? Uh, read it the first time really fast. Um, I had an experience once where I could not get past the first page. I was trying to understand what the writer was saying. There was all this really dense jargon and words I, I was unfamiliar with. And I, I wasted, you know, about a half a day just sitting there trying to get through that first page. And I was parsing it all out because it was all new to me. This was when I was still doing undergraduate work. And finally, uh, I just pushed on and I read the rest of the article and about page two or three, things started to fall into place. I started to understand what this really dense and difficult academic article was about. So when I say read the first time, I'm saying skim that puppy the first time, get a bird's eye view, then reread it with greater attention. And you can double up this move later on when you get better at it, but I would actually recommend a third read for the annotations. But if you're pressed for time, do it on the second time around. What do I mean by annotations? This is when you write on the article that you're working with. Um, so print it off, or if you have the option, mark it up digitally. But put in question marks. What does this mean? What's this word? What's this concept? I need to come back to this. Put in places where you agree or disagree with what's being said. Highlight things that you find interesting. Get, get in there and, you know, really work with the text as it were, okay? Um, don't just read the article and then think, I've got it, I've got it in my head, because you don't. You need to chew on this, really work it over and absorb this information to do a good job of summarizing what's been said. And this goes beyond this particular assignment. When you go to do research in other courses, you will likely be very pressed for time because you'll procrastinate. But if you take these sorts of approaches with your research paper, the very thing that we're doing here in this course, stretching out the process of writing a research paper over an entire semester, if you can take these skills and, and apply them to the work that you do in the future, you're going to find it a lot easier to do the writing when you hit the keyboard. Right? Like you might feel, and this is, this is the thing I think, is that we, we think about our writing as when we type. But writing involves fueling the tank, as it were. And when you read, reread, and annotate your source text or texts, you're fueling that tank. You're getting information that will allow you to respond and go back to the page and, and work with that stuff. So we first read to get a sense of the passage's main ideas and structure. Our second read is slower, where we highlight key passages and main points. And then annotation is making notes to clarify trouble spots. A quick thing about annotation, when you make notes while you're reading an article, and you have that article in class with you later on, this is a pro tip for y'all, and your prof says, does anyone have any questions or comments use one of your annotations. Even if you're perfectly clear on what is being said there, it's going to go a long way to making your prof, you know, really think you, you've, you've got it going on. Because you do at that point. Because you're interacting with the content in a way that validates, you know, them having gotten up that morning and come to teach you. Uh, and that might seem very mercenary in the way that I'm suggesting this. You're like, well, that almost sounds like I should be lying to my prof. Like I'm asking questions just for the sake of asking questions. <laughs> you know, just show your prof that you give a crap about the class. Go 
goes a long way. But those annotations can help you, especially if you went out on the weekend and killed brain cells in all the various ways that we can. Because then you, you wake up Monday morning, you can't remember what any of the thoughts that you had. All the brilliant things you thought about that article, <laughs> totally gone. But you've got that annotation to back you up. All right, then we summarize each section of the source text. So we read, we reread, we annotate the source text. Now we summarize each section of the source text. Break it up into its sections. Sometimes articles are broken up for us. Those sections are laid out for us. They have, you know, little subheaders. You do not need to do this for your papers, by the way. Um, until you reach, like, papers that are running 10 to 20 pages, you don't need subheaders because your information doesn't require that kind of breakup. Um, but we can summarize each section of the source text. And you might even go paragraph by paragraph, but that's not really section by section. Because sometimes, as we'll note, when if, as you'll note, if you take a look at the articles that you've been assigned, some of those paragraphs are quite short. Others, as in the case of Steve Rifle's article about Godzilla, there's a, there's a page long paragraph which incidentally can be summarized in a single sentence. Rifle summarizes the plot of Godzilla. <laughs> That's what he does at that point. Now I might want to add another sentence that identifies, you know, the, the plot of the movie, but I don't need to break it down in the same way that Rifle does in that section. I wouldn't want to go necessarily paragraph by paragraph, but section by section. Okay. That said, if going through the article during your annotation run and, and, and just going, okay, what's this paragraph say? And, and writing in one sentence what it says in that paragraph helps you, then do that. In fact, doing that as a first step, as a sort of interstitial step, before you go to deciding where the sections even are, like where are the sections? What's the outline of this? That's something that you need to determine as you're working through the article to be able to summarize it in this way. And uh, as Will Hoyt says, a summary of several pages can sometimes be as brief as one sentence. Um, it says this is what we're doing with our workshops. These are the things that we're going to be doing uh, coming up here shortly. We're going to be discussing it in class. Um, one group will, will, will come and do the discussion on Hiroshima. Another group will come and do the discussion on the Godzilla article. Now, once you've summarized each section of the source text, you're pretty much ready to write your first draft. Keep in mind, this assignment is 500 words. And that might seem like a lot, but you're taking articles that are thousands of words and you are, you're crushing them down until they're this tight 500 word document. In your opening section, this is super important. In your opening section, you do not need an introduction. You don't need an introduction for your summary. For your standalone summary, you do not need an introduction. Okay, I have to say that a lot because I still get students doing it. You're so trained to write really great and fancy, interesting introductions from your high school English courses that you, you just can't break yourself of it. Don't write an introduction. You don't need one. The only thing you need to do here is introduce the topic, the title, and the author of the source text. So your first sentence should read something like this. In Hiroshima, historians reassess, Gar Al Perovitz argues, whatever Gar Al Perovitz argues. And I want my students to start asking themselves the question, what is Gar Al Perovitz's thesis? What is Steve Rifle's thesis? What do they argue? And that's going to be some of what we're going to talk about in our, our upcoming workshops. What is their, their, their thesis? That's all you need for the beginning of a, a summary. In title, author argues thesis. Okay? Do not... You don't need to be fancy with this, okay? You don't need to riff on it. Some of you are sitting there right now and you're going... But I'm an artist and I can't handle this sort of, you know, it's crushing me down and putting me in a box. I'm going to put you in the box and I'm going to put a muzzle on you for the first assignment. You don't get to say what you think about any of this yet because you need to learn how to replicate what they say first. Again, I'm going to go back to this. I've seen a ton of student papers where they can tell me something about what they think about whatever the topic is that they need to write on, but they can't do research. 
They don't know how to take someone else's ideas and convey them in their own voice in an accurate way. Okay, And that's the goal of this assignment. It is super, super valuable. I don't want your opinion on this paper. I don't want your flair. I want you to tell me what Gar Alperovic says. I want you to tell me what Steve Rifle says. Okay? In the body, you're going to present, in your own words, the author's ideas. Rifle's ideas about Godzilla, the original 1954 movie Gojira, or Gar Alperovitz in his scathing indictment of the United States and their involvement in the dropping of a bomb, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Okay? Their ideas, not yours. I don't want to know what you think about atomic energy or bombs. I don't know, want to know what you think about Godzilla. I don't need your opinion. Okay? You will present, in your own words, the author's ideas, including information your readers need to understand the author's intent. And for those of you who are listening who aren't my students, but even for my students, thinking down the road to when you are going to be in the workplace, you might be like, what does any of this have to do with practical writing in the real world? If you can't take someone else's ideas and show with accuracy that you understood what they said, you're going to have a tough time winning arguments. Like if you, if there's a new policy at work and you can't effectively summarize what that policy is, but you don't like it, you just don't like it. But if you can't say exactly what it is when you go to argue why you think it ought to be changed, it's going to weaken your position. You need to be able to represent what other people have said accurately if you're going to argue forcefully. And then for your conclusion, well, generally summaries don't need a conclusion either. You're going to end with a summary of whatever the author's last point is. Now we need to make sure this is, there's, we've got a, we've got a bit of a, um, I don't know what we want to say. There's a, 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 there's a problem. There's a difficulty with Gar Alperovitz's article because our Alperovitz concludes and then he does a sort of like, oh, and one more thing. But he's already concluded when he gets to that, oh, and one more thing. So you don't want to necessarily end with the last thing Gar Alperovitz says, but rather with what his last point is. What is his conclusion? You end with the conclusion of whatever you're uh, summarizing. Now, this is uh, adapted from a, a textbook called The Active Reader by Eric Henderson. It's this wonderful list. It's just great. I love it to pieces of guidelines for writing a summary. Okay. Um, and they kind of go in pairs. So here we go. A and B go in pairs. Follow the exact order of the original, but B, avoid all repetition and reiteration. So again, A, follow the exact order of the original, but B, avoid all repetition and reiteration. This is super important for those of you who will be doing Gar Alperovitz's article, because as we're going to see in our workshop, Alperovitz is repetitive. He reiterates his ideas over and over and over and over and over again. So if you followed the exact order of the original and you said what Alperovitz says every time he said it, it would get really repetitious really quick. Okay. So instead, you, you, you know, you could do that section by section summary, but then you look for any spaces where it is unnecessarily repetitive and you condense those. You move the information around a little. Though for those of you who are doing Steve Rifle's article on Godzilla, you won't have this problem. You'll get to do A without any necessity to worry about B. Okay. C, include only the most important points. And D, avoid irrelevant details. Now, with Alperovitz, he doesn't get too granular. He doesn't get really down there with details in the same way that Steve Rifle does. Um, so Gar Alperovitz occasionally will talk about, say, a really important historical figure. You want to ask yourself the question, is including, say, Eisenhower's name a relevant detail for your reader? Or could you simply say something more summary related, like, you know, a high ranking, um, you know, such and such said, right? Or Alperovitz 
quotes a number of and give a summary concept for all of these various names. Rather than including those names or particular dates, you just got to ask yourself, does my reader need this detail? Include only the most important points, the big picture. Think of it like Google Maps. You know, we zoom out, we zoom in. You've got to be thinking about content in that way. Are you, are you zoomed in too much? Can you see the people that live there? Or, you know, are you zoomed out too far and now you can't tell where Edmonton is on the map? That kind of thing. But you want to avoid relevant details. And that is going to be super important for those of you who are doing Rifle's uh, article on Godzilla because Rifle is a film historian and he knows so much about Godzilla that he, like, he does commentaries for the DVDs. So we, we, we have to be careful about how much of his information he includes because there are points at which... He's got some really cool trivia that you might be like, wow, that's really neat. Um, like, where did Godzilla's name come from? Uh, but does your reader really need to know that? Is that related to his thesis? You know, and what is, again, I got to come back to this. We're going to need to know for our workshops coming up this week, what's their big idea? If we don't know what an, an article's thesis is, how can we even quote them well? How can we even quote them well? I'll, I'll talk about more, more about that when we get to uh, using quotations in our work. Uh, avoid repeating the author name and title. 500 words means that your document's probably going to be about two pages long. So you don't need to keep slapping your reader in the face with rifle says this, rifle says that, rifle says this other thing. A pair of it says this, a pair of it says that, a pair of it says this other thing. You don't need that. And you've got pronouns too, right? El Peravitz and Rifle both use he, him pronouns. You just go, he says, he, you know, because there's nobody else saying anything uh, for the most part in your summaries. Okay. Um, do not add your own opinions. Do not add your own opinions. Now, They Say I Say confuses this a little bit because as I said earlier, chapter two of They Say I Say is about how you integrate summaries into larger arguments. That's simply me making sure that we're covering the information from They Say I Say about summaries, but also trying to tell you why this matters. Why does it matter that we're doing a summary? Is this just an assignment that English profs assign? Is this, is this that sort of thing? Is this the only course I'm ever going to need this? No, you're going to need this in all your courses that you write research papers for. Knowing how to summarize is going to be useful in every one of your papers from here until you finish your degree. Okay. And it's going to be, it's going to be useful once you're done too. trust me on that. But for this paper to ensure that we're focused on summary and not anything else, I don't want your own opinions. I don't want your opinions here. I don't need to know what you think about these things. Okay. Use your own words, but be careful not to, to do this in a way that's like you're bending yourself into a pretzel to avoid using some of the terms that these writers use. Like there isn't a good synonym for atomic bomb. There just isn't. There isn't. Okay. I've seen students bend themselves into pretzels about this kind of thing. They're, they've got like weapons of mass destructions. And I'm like, that, that's, an, that's anachronistic because that wasn't even a term at the time. Um, massive, you know devastating item or something I don't that's ridiculous but that's the kind of thing that my students get themselves bent into trying to do this and I, I think that comes out of a propensity to do what I call thesaurizing which is when you you have a synonym for uh, every word you include your key terms and phrases we're going to learn more about this later but if you want to jump ahead it's chapter eight of they say I say your key terms and phrases should be the same words every time. Atomic bomb, atomic bomb, atomic bomb, giant monster, giant monster, giant monster. You don't need synonyms for your key terms and phrases. When it says use your own words, what we're saying there is don't copy and paste and then just stick synonyms on top of it. And it's easier to do G. G is super easy if you do points one and two. Read, reread, and annotate the source text and then summarize each section. And then you go and you crunch that down into an even tighter version. Because like, if you summarize each section of the source text, this is something I didn't say earlier, um, you'll probably end up with around 1,000 to 1,200 words. I know this because in workshops that I used to do with students, I would have them do that summarize each section of the source text for class. And then they'd all hand in a, a section, just one section. They were all responsible for one section. I can't do this anymore because our class sizes have gotten so big. 
but they'd all hand in this one section and then I would put it into a word document. And every time it was about a thousand to 1200 words. And I'd say, boy, we've got some work to do. Right. And so between those summarizing each section of the source text and writing your, your first draft, you're going to be cutting, but you'll learn to use your own words if you've really internalized the information that you're supposed to be summarizing. And then finally, write concisely. And we're going to talk about concision in an upcoming uh, class lecture. Um, but for those of you out there who are just listening to the podcast, oh my gosh, learning how to write concisely, getting rid of wordiness might be the greatest thing you'll ever do for your writing. Now, there are a few things in They Say, I Say that might we might feel confusing based upon some of the stuff that I've said. This first one, though, is in support of the first two points that we just got from Eric Henderson's Active Reader. So you're supposed to follow the exact order of the original, but avoid all repetition and reiteration. And in They Say, I Say, Graf and Birkenstein say you should avoid list summaries. The author says, they say, uh, quote, the author says many different things about his subject. First, he says... Then he makes a point that, in addition, he says, and then he writes, also he shows that, and then he says, and our way to avoid doing this list summary thing is to watch out for that repetition and reiteration and to synthesize the sections. You know, like if, if El Perovitz says the same thing over and over again, we're not going to say it every time that he says it. We're going to say it once, maybe twice, uh, at key points that make sense for our summary. Okay, so we want to follow the exact order of the original, avoiding all repetition and reiteration to avoid those list summaries. And then we want to check our draft against our source text. Okay, so you've got your first draft there. Now you got to check it against the source text and ask yourself the following questions. Is it comprehensive? What do we mean by comprehensive? Does it include everything your reader needs to know to understand the point that either rifle or Alperovitz were making. Is it comprehensive? And that's why you want to avoid all that detail is because you've got a lot of information to cover, but you need to just include the most essential stuff, the points that really matter to support that writer's thesis. Is it brief? Okay. Is it, you know, did you go on too long? Students are always like, can I have another hundred words? No, you can't. It's 500 words, full stop. And then I've got students who are like, well, I've only got 300. Can I? No, you can't because you probably haven't been comprehensive. So these things work hand in hand. If you go to 500, you've probably been comprehensive. If you go over 500, you're no longer brief. If you're way under 500, you're brief, but you're probably not comprehensive. And we've got this cartoon of the Hobbit, the Hobbit, a brief summary. And we've got Gandalf saying, come on, Bilbo, let's adventure. A dragon, gold, stuff. And Bilbo says, K. And then it says, traveling and adventure. And then Bilbo in the last panel says, home now with me magic ring. And is it brief? Yes. Is it comprehensive? No. It's not comprehensive at all. We don't know half of what happened in The Hobbit from that particular summary. So we want it to be comprehensive. We want it to be brief. We want it to be accurate. So ask yourself the question, is it accurate? And we want it to be neutral. And those things go hand in hand as well, because quite often we may have an opinion about what we're writing about in whatever course it might be. But we need to be able to accurately replicate what someone else has said on that subject matter. Okay? And we need to remain neutral about it. We can't bring our bias to the table necessarily. Graf and Birkenstein say a good summary has a focus or spin that allows the summary to fit with your own agenda while still being true to the text you are summarizing. Well, that sounds like that's a contradiction, right? That Graf and Birkenstein are saying something that this list isn't. Well, that's because again, Graf and Birkenstein are talking about summaries that go inside bigger papers. What I'm talking about right here is you writing a standalone summary. So Graf and Birkenstein are saying what you need to do to include summary information in a research paper that has a point. The point that you're going to make on this paper is whatever Rifle's point was or whatever Alperovitz's point was. So accurate and neutral. And finally, is it independent? Can it stand on its own? Can it stand on its own? 
And all the way through this, we need to be doing what Graf and Birkenstein talk about and they say, I say, which is playing the believing game. Maybe you don't give a crap about Godzilla. Maybe you don't, you know, you, you checked out the 1954 film on E-Reserve and you're like, it's boring. I totally disagree with Steve Rifle. He thinks it's the greatest movie ever and it's really not. And that's fine. You don't need to love the movie. You don't. But you also don't need to love Calculus. You need to, to some degree, love it enough to get through the course. Right? You've got to make yourself get up in the morning and do the work. So we play the believing game all the way through university. It's not just as crap from Birkenstein would say, just for summaries. We need to be playing it frequently in university. Being able to take someone else's ideas and, and absorb them enough that we can talk about them and we can debate about them without immediately jumping to the knee-jerk reaction of, well, I just disagree. I don't like it. I don't like what they had to say. Quite often students will do this as a way of avoiding revealing how little they know about it. I just don't, I don't agree with what they say. Why don't you agree? Well, I just, I think their point was flawed or something like that. Playing the believing game requires that you absorb that information then be able to say, okay, no, what, under what circumstances would somebody think this? Under what circ, can I, can I see where they're coming from? And we're going to find out that later on in the semester that the believing game is crucial for bringing in what we're going to call, what, what Graf and Bergenstein called a naysayer, someone who disagrees with us. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. When you're checking your draft against the source text and you want to check for accuracy, one of the things you want to do is take a look at the list of really strong verbs that Graf and Bergenstein supply. And that list of verbs is broken down into like authorial intent. Students take a look at that list of verbs and I think they think they can just throw darts at it to decide which word they're going to use. But don't say that Rifle questions something unless he actually questions it. Don't say that Alperovitz implores if Alperovitz isn't imploring. Make sure that the verbs that you're using match the intent of the author you are summarizing. And don't be afraid to use the word argue, said, or states more than once. Again, you don't need to synonymize. Uh, the word said becomes relatively invisible in fiction. Go read, go, go grab a fiction book off the shelf and see in a page of dialogue, how many times do they use the word said? Do they synonymize like mad? If they do, they're probably a bad writer. Um, using said over and over again, it just becomes a sort of invisible word. It's a key term for us. So we can say argues, states, insists. We don't have to go looking for some polysyllabic monstrosity in a thesaurus to make ourselves look smart. I don't want you to try to make me think you're smart because of great, ob obscure, esoteric word choices. I want you to demonstrate your brilliance with clear, concise, and accessible prose. And you need to do that in this summary, right? You're going to be using your own words. And then finally, you want to rewrite and revise your summary. I have a, I have a book on revision, and the first line of it is, uh, to write is to revise. Um, and I believe this wholeheartedly. Uh, no one does their best work in their first draft. No one. Not even the people like, what about Jack Kerouac? And I'm like, no. <laughs> he was probably thinking about it. He was probably drafting in his head. We need to take the time to rewrite and revise our work. Okay, We're looking to correct issues of content or tone. And we need to keep thinking, our summary must stand on its own. And what do I, what do I mean by that? This goes back to that idea of the comprehensive writing. And here's a really important question that you need to be asking, not only for this assignment, but for everything you ever write in university. Is would someone who doesn't know what you know understand what you're talking about? You could ask yourself this question this way. Would you have understand, uh, understood what you just wrote two weeks ago? Or did you include in some, some detail that you didn't flesh out, something that you didn't explain fully? You need to treat your reader like they know nothing because they don't. Don't write for me. Write for the person on the street. 
Assume that they don't know anything about Hiroshima. Assume that they don't know anything about Godzilla. Keeping to, you know, those articles. You can even get a friend to read it and say, is there anything here that's confusing? You know, your summary must stand on its own. So you've got to write it in a way that does that. And then finally, and, and we're going to come back around to this, so don't get too worried about it right now. You're going to document your source text. You're going to document the article you summarized on a works cited page that will be separate, not a separate document, but a separate page within the document that you uh, supply. And so you're going to have a page where you include um, Gar Alperovitz's name and uh, Steve Rifle's name and the name of their articles, etc. And it's very bitsy and it looks really weird. We're going to come back to that later. Okay. Um, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this. This is what we call uh, citation style. Um, and there are, are three major ones that get used in university. In this course, we're going to be using one called MLA. That's all you really need to know at this point. Um, uh, but you could always just, you know, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just pause the video and you could be like, I'm going to take all this information down right now because Dr. Prashant's laid it all out for me. Yes, I have. Um, but uh, this time I, I'm going to do that. I'm just supplying the information to you. Um, but you, I also want to teach you how to actively do this later on. Okay. So the last thing I want to say is that summary isn't just about paraphrasing one or two points. It's not just about getting that section of the text or that section of the text accurately. It's not just that you understood that one part of the article. And I see this frequently. I see students doing the paragraph by paragraph summary and just making that their draft. And then they get to about 400 words of the 500 they need to do, and they aren't even halfway through whatever article they're summarizing. So what they do is they very quickly sort of scan what they have left. They throw a couple sentences in there and they're like, F it. Uh, I'm, just, I'm sending this in and hoping for the best. Hail Mary. And they do a Hail Mary pass and they hope that, you know, Dr. Prashant's in a good mood that day. He was drinking margaritas right before he marked. Um, here's the thing. That's not helpful for you in the long run as a student. That's not helpful for you in the long run as a writer. Your summary needs to contain the same thing that a good paper would, which is a clear overarching goal and a unifying agenda. It should not be a miscellaneous grab bag of information from the article that you are summarizing. And this is important for you to know here at the beginning of the semester. If your writing doesn't have a point, then what's the point in writing it? So as you work on the summary, you need to be asking yourself, what was Rifle's point? What was his big idea? Because it needs to be in your first sentence on the summary. What was Alperovitz's, you know, what's his, what's his thesis? What's his big idea? Because if you don't understand what the big idea is of the things that you are reading, you will have a great amount of trouble writing about them.